Welcome to Theology Made, I'm Jordan, and get ready for a wild ride through the mystical, controversial, and occasionally mind-bending world of the Enneagram. Now, a lot of Christians tend to love the Enneagram. Maybe you're curious about it, so let's make it really simple. The following video has been approved for appropriate audiences. Theological reflection advised. The Enneagram, it's like astrology, met a personality test, and had a baby, raised by ancient wisdom and spiritual traditions. I'm kidding, sort of. It does have some ancient roots. Picture this, it's ancient times, and someone's doodling a nine-point star inside a circle. Little do they know, they just created the world's most complex personality quiz logo. The word Enneagram comes from the Greek word Ene, which is nine, and Gramos, which is figure. It's like they decided to make geometry sound fancy, but also mysterious. And so some folks, uh, they trace the Enneagram's roots back to, well, you'll never guess it, Pythagoras and his little funky number theories. Uh, all the math nerds can rejoice. The uh, Elven Dragon Slayer, the uh, 10 point power sword. <laughs> Others, it's ancient Babylonian astrology. Because why not throw a little zodiac into the mix? And then there's some who say, no, 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 it's not those, it's the Christian desert fathers in Egypt. Nothing like a little sand and solitude to make you ponder the world of personality. But here's the kicker, uh, there's no historical evidence for any of that. So it's kind of like trying to trace the origins of the high five. Everyone's got a theory, you know, but no one really knows uh, for sure. So let's get into then the modern Enneagram and how it moved from kind of mysticism over to psychology. So if we fast forward to the 20th century, uh, we have George Ivanovich Gurdjieff, strong name, right? He's a mystic and he's a spiritual teacher who's kind of like the Indiana Jones of esoteric wisdom. Indiana Jones. He introduces the Enneagram symbol to the West, but he's not using it for personality types. For Gurdjieff, it's all about cosmic laws and processes. It's like he's trying to explain the universe kind of using a fancy pie chart. And then comes Oscar, Ichazo in the 1950s. And this is the name to remember. He's a Bavarian born philosopher. And he's like, hey, what if we use this cool symbol to describe personality types? And so he develops a whole system linking the Enneagram to ego fixation, holy ideas, passions. It's kind of like he's creating a spiritual Dungeons and Dragons character sheet. But wait, there's more. Uh, in the 1970s, the psychiatrist Claudio Norejo takes uh, his ideas, that is Ichazo's, and he kind of just runs with them. He's like the Gordon Ramsay of personality theory. He adds psychological flavor and he kind of spices things up a bit with some modern psych concepts. Well, from there, the Enneagram then begins to move and it goes mainstream. We've gone mainstream. And so in the 1970s, the Enneagram started spreading in Catholic circles faster than you can say Pope Mobile. It's like the church discovered a new form of confession that instead of telling your sins, you're telling your personality type. I guess the Enneagram was the first CrossFit. So who are some of the key players then that really helped popularize the Enneagram to the public? And the first two names to know are Don Rizzo and Russ Hudson. These guys are kind of like the dynamic duo of the Enneagram theory. Uh, they develop the ideas of levels of development for each type, it's like saying you're not just a number, you're a number with layers. Yes. Ogres have layers, onions have layers. And then Helen Palmer, she brings a more kind of psychological approach and she then introduces the concept of subtypes. It's like she's adding kind of expansion packs to the Enneagram game. Here's your personality side quest. No, this is my quest. And then, uh, who's really well known today is Richard Rohr. He is the uh, Franciscan monk, a uh, friar, sorry, who makes the Enneagram palpable for Christians. He's like, wait, 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 this is not just like this new age mumbo jumbo, it's actually a good tool for spiritual growth. And so then suddenly, church basements everywhere, they are filled with people trying to figure out if they're a helper, or if they're an achiever, or if they're gonna achieve some help. And then we get into the actual nine types. <music> It is kind of like a cosmic character selection screen. So what are the types and what is everyone talking about? Well, buckle up, Buttercup, because here we go. Let's get into the nine types of the Enneagram. Number one, the ones. These are the reformers. 
the perfectionist who's always trying to make the world a better place. Uh, they're like the person who straightens crooked picture frames in other people's houses. Number two, the helper. This is the caring, uh, people-pleasing type. Uh, they'll give you the shirt off their back and then feel resentful that you didn't compliment their undershirt. <laughs> and then three, and this is where I land, that's the achiever. Uh, this is the success-oriented, pragmatic types. Uh, they're the ones with the to-do list for their to-do list. And as a little side confession, if I check something off my to-do list and it wasn't written down, I will write it down just so I can check it off. Yes, I know, I need help. Number four is the individualist. Uh, these are the kind of sensitive, withdrawn types. They're not brooding. They just feel things more deeply than you do. Thank you very much. Number five, the investigator. These are the intense, more cerebral type. Like they've probably already psychoanalyzed you based on your coffee order. Orange mocha frappuccino! <laughs> Number six, the loyalist. These are the committed uh, security security oriented type. They're preparing for the zombie apocalypse just in case. I wonder if that's what Zuckerberg is doing on Hawaii. <laughs> Number seven, the enthusiast. Uh, these are the busy, fun-loving type. They've got FOMO so bad they're planning their next adventure while on their current one. And then eight, the challenger. The powerful, dominant type. They don't break the rules. They just strongly suggest that maybe the rules should be reconsidered based on their position. And then sort of the opposite of that is the peacemaker. Uh, that's number nine. These are the easygoing, self-effacing type. Uh, they are so conflict avoidant, they apologize to chairs when they bump into them. And what's interesting about these nine is that they have also been compared to the nine to the cardinal sins. And so if you kind of look up Enneagram and cardinal sins, uh, you're going to see a comparison of what matches with what. So then if it wasn't complicated enough, we have wings, we have arrows, and we have triads. So just when you thought you kind of had to figure it figured out, okay, I'm a one, I'm a three, I'm a four, the Enneagram throws some curveballs uh, right at you. First up is wings. You're not just a number. You've got flavors on either side. It's like kind of a personality type fusion cuisine. And then you have arrows that each type is connected to two others for growth and stress. Kind of like a cosmic game of shoots and ladders. And then you have triads. And these types are divided into three groups based on kind of their, their primary center of intelligence, uh, head, heart, or gut. Kind of like the Enneagram's version of rock, paper, scissor. And so let's talk then about the Enneagram today. Uh, is it just simply a self-help sensation? Is it just a controversy magnet? Or is it something that actually can be beneficial for spiritual growth? And so these days, the Enneagram is everywhere. It's kind of like the avocado toast of personality systems. It's avocado toast, of course, for the millennials. Obviously. It's trendy. It's a bit overexposed, but it's still pretty, pretty satisfying. Uh, in business, companies uh, use it for team building because nothing says corporate synergy like knowing your boss is an eight with a seven wing. In relationships, uh, couples will often use it to understand each other better kind of like a user manual for your partner, minus the assembly instructions, batteries not included. And most importantly for us is in faith communities. Uh, many churches, they've embraced it as a tool for spiritual growth. It's like they're saying, know thyself, then love thy neighbor as thyself. Unless thy is a healthy unto, then set some boundaries. But it's not all peace, love, and self-discovery. Uh, the Enneagram also does have its fair share of Critics. So there are some psychologists who argue it lacks scientific validity. It's like they're the party poopers in the Enneagram's self-discovery disco. Some religious folks worry it's a little too new agey. It's like they're afraid the Enneagram is a gateway drug to crystal healing and past life regression. Others say uh, people use it to just excuse bad behavior. Sorry I was rude. I'm an eight. It's the new sorry. Mercury's in the retrograde. So what's the future of the Enneagram? Well, as we speak, the Enneagram is still evolving. There are new books, there are podcasts, there are Instagram accounts that pop up daily, uh, each kind of claiming to have the hottest Enneagram take. So will it stand uh, the test of time or go the way of phrenology? Well, only time will tell, uh, but one thing is for sure. Uh, it's got people talking about personality, self-awareness, and growth in new ways. And for what it's worth, 
I do think it's a helpful tool in understanding yourself. However, I think what it really does is it tells you the person you are think you're supposed to be. I said that weird, but it tells you the person you think you are supposed to be, which honestly, knowing that is half the battle. So there you have it, friends. The Enneagram is a little bit mystic, a little bit psychological, and a whole lot of, why am I like this? And so whether you are a diehard Enneagram enthusiast or maybe just a skeptical observer, um, you've got to admit, it's a really good conversation starter. Now, if you're going to excuse me, I need to go figure out if my spirit animal is a peacemaking dolphin or a reforming eagle. I'm just kidding. I'm a thriving four. If you know, you know.